Lords and ladies, farmers and labourers, welcome to Legendary Law, where we explore the wisdom of the ages and bring it into the modern world. Today we have something truly extraordinary in store for you. We're about to witness an incredible speech, a timeless masterpiece, revitalised and presented in a way that resonates with our contemporary minds. Picture this. Athens, a bustling city of ancient Greece filled with philosophers, poets and thinkers. In the heart of it all, a wise man named Socrates stands on trial, facing his accusers and a jury that will determine his fate. His words, as relevant today as they were centuries ago, have been meticulously modernized, capturing the essence of his message in a language we can easily grasp and connect with. No more deciphering complex ancient texts or struggling to grasp archaic expressions. We've brought Socrates' profound insights to life breaking down the barriers of time and language, so you can fully absorb the wisdom he imparts. This is Socrates, like you've never experienced before, speaking directly to your heart and mind, provoking thoughts and challenging the status quo. Prepare to be captivated. Socrates' words will inspire, provoke, and make you question your own beliefs. His powerful defense, laced with courage and integrity, will stir your soul. Today we embark on a journey of intellectual exploration, discovering the true essence of a man who chose honesty over self-preservation and wisdom over conformity. So, my fellow seekers of knowledge, let us embark on this extraordinary voyage together. Get ready to be enlightened, challenged and inspired as we present the modernized words of Socrates, bringing his timeless wisdom directly to your ears. Prepare to immerse yourself in a captivating narrative that transcends time, reminding us of the eternal quest for knowledge and the pursuit of a life well lived. Socrates' Defense As I stood there, folks, listening to my accusers, I had a hard time recognizing myself. They weaved quite a tale, barely a word of truth, but boy did they spin a yarn. What blew my mind was when they warned you not to be swayed by my eloquent speech. They should have felt silly saying that. I mean, once I start talking, it's pretty obvious that eloquence isn't my style, unless by eloquence they mean being truthful. Then sure, I'm your guy, but man, their approach and mine couldn't be more different. I mean, they barely got a single fact right, but I promise you'll get the full story from me. No fancy speech, just words and ideas as they come to me. At my age, I shouldn't be standing here trying to impress you with flowery words. Please don't expect that from me. And i got to ask, if you catch me using familiar phrases that you've heard me say in the market or over a game of dice, don't be shocked or interrupt me. Listen, I'm over 70 and this is my first time in a courtroom. I'm not familiar with this place or its rules. Pretend I'm a newcomer in town. You'd forgive a stranger if he spoke in his own way, right? That seems fair to me. Don't worry about my style. It may be rough around the edges. Just focus on whether I'm in the right. Let's aim for a fair verdict and truthful speech. First, let me respond to some of the long-standing charges, and then I'll address the more recent ones. I've had many accusers over the years, filling your ears with their false accusations. They're the ones I fear more than my current accusers. Their tales, told when you were young and impressionable, have stuck in your minds. Stories of Socrates, the wise man, the one who questions everything above and below and can convince you black is white. Those accusers scare me. They're the ones spreading rumors, making people believe I don't respect the gods. Their accusations are old, told when you were kids, and I had no chance to defend myself. The toughest part is I don't even know who they all are. I can't bring them here and cross-examine them, so I'm basically shadow boxing. Let's just agree that I have two types of accusers, the long-standing ones and the recent ones. I think it makes sense to deal with the old charges first, as you've heard those for a longer time and more frequently. All right then, time for me to defend myself. Let's get started. All right, folks, we've got a tough job ahead of us. I have to convince you that this long-standing negative image you've got of me is false. I hope I can do that for both our sakes, and I hope you're willing to listen. I understand it's a big ask. We'll see what happens. For now, I'll just follow the rules and make my case. Let's start from the beginning. What exactly am I accused of that's got people bad-mouthing me? What sparked this whole thing and nudged Miletus to take action? In essence, they say, Socrates is a bad influence, an inquisitive fella, poking around in things on earth and heaven, turning bad arguments into good, and teaching others the same. That's the gist of it. Maybe it sounds familiar, like that character in Aristophanes' comedy, this so-called Socrates who can supposedly walk on air and spouts nonsense about stuff I don't claim to know anything about. Don't get me wrong, I've got no issue with those studying natural philosophy. But truth be told, that's just not my scene. Many of you here can vouch for that. Tell your neighbors if you've ever heard me ramble on about such things. What do they say? You can take their word and judge the rest of these allegations. And about the rumors of me being a paid teacher, equally baseless. Mind you, if a guy's good at teaching, I respect him for making a living out of it. You've got folks like Gorgias, Prodicus, and Hippias. 
who travel city to city, persuading youngsters to leave their free local teachers and pay them instead. Heck, they're happy to pay. There's even this philosopher from Paros, Evanus, living right here in Athens. Here's how I found out about him. I bumped into Callias, a guy who spent a fortune on sophists. Knowing he has sons, I asked Callias, if your kids were horses or cows, it'd be easy to find a trainer to make them the best. But since they're human, who do you have in mind to mentor them? Someone who understands human and political virtue. He said, Evanus, he charges five mini. Lucky Evanus, I thought, if he truly has such wisdom and charges so little. If I had that wisdom, I'd probably be full of myself. But truth is, I don't have that kind of knowledge. I bet one of you is thinking, why are we here, Socrates? What's the root of all these accusations? You must have done something out of the ordinary. Your reputation wouldn't be what it is if you were just like everyone else. So tell us, what's the deal? Please enlighten us, for we would prefer not to judge you hastily without understanding the truth. I see that as a fair question, and I'll try to clarify why I've earned this tag of being wise and why it's brought me such a nasty reputation. Stick with me here, even if I sound like I'm joking, because I promise you, I'm speaking my truth. See, this wisdom I'm infamous for, it's a very human type of wisdom, nothing extraordinary. That's the extent of my wisdom. Anyone claiming I have some sort of divine wisdom, well, they're misrepresenting me. Now, Athens, I'd appreciate it if you didn't interrupt me, even if I sound a bit outrageous. The words I'm about to say, they're not my own. I'll point you towards a more reliable source to vouch for my wisdom, or lack thereof the god of Delphi. You remember Cherophon, right? Old friend of mine and of yours. He was in exile with you and came back with you. Cherophon was known for jumping the gun, and one day he goes to Delphi, asks the oracle, and please let me finish. He asks whether there's anyone wiser than me. The oracle replies, no man is wiser. Cherophon isn't around anymore, but his brother who's here today can confirm this. Why am I bringing this up? To help explain why I've got such a bad rap. When I first heard the oracle's words, I was confused. I thought, well, what's the god getting at? I know I'm not wise. So how can I be the wisest? Gods don't lie, it's not in their nature. After much pondering, I decided to test the oracle's statement. If I found someone wiser than me, I could go back to the oracle with proof. So I approached a well-respected politician. But the more we talked, the more I realized he wasn't as wise as he thought he was. When I pointed this out, he wasn't pleased, and neither were his supporters who heard me. As I walked away, I thought, sure, neither of us knows anything truly worthwhile, but at least I don't pretend to know what I don't. So in that respect, I've got one up on him. Then I went to another and another, each time finding the same thing. I knew I was making enemies, and it worried me. But I felt compelled to prioritize the word of the God. So, I said to myself, I have to visit all those who are considered knowledgeable to figure out this oracle. And, Athenians, I swear by the dog I swear, because I have to tell you the truth. My journey led me to a shocking realization. Those with the highest reputations were almost the most ignorant whereas those considered inferior were often wiser, more virtuous. After the politicians, I thought to myself, if there's any place I'll be outsmarted, it's going to be among the poets. I took some of their most complex verses, asked for uh, explanations, thinking they'd teach me a thing or two. Can you believe it? It turns out most people here could have explained those poems better than the poets themselves. It hit me then. Poets create their poetry, not out of wisdom, but thanks to their natural talent, and inspiration. I noticed that just like the politicians, these poets, riding high on their fame, believed they were knowledgeable about all sorts of stuff, which wasn't the case. So I walked away from them too, thinking I'm better off, because at least I don't pretend to know what I don't. Then I turned to the artisans. I knew for sure I didn't know much, but these guys, they knew a lot of things I didn't, which made them wiser than me in that respect. But just like the poets, they had this misconception that the, their skills made them knowledgeable in all high matters. So I thought to myself, would I want their knowledge if it came with their ignorance? My answer was no. I was better off as I was. This pursuit of mine, trying to figure out the oracle, has earned me quite a lot of enemies and led to many misconceptions about me. People hear me questioning others and they think I'm wise. But here's the truth, Athenians. Only God is wise. When the oracle said I was the wisest, it was simply highlighting that human wisdom is worth almost nothing. So I go about questioning everyone who appears wise, and if they're not, I prove it, defending the oracle's words. This task takes up all my time, leaving me poor as a church mouse. 
On top of that, rich, idle young men find it amusing to watch me grill these so-called wise men. They've picked up my methods, interrogating others, revealing their ignorance. But instead of blaming themselves, these wise men blame me, calling me a terrible influence on the youth. If someone asks them what's so bad about Socrates, what does he do or teach, they can't answer. So they fall back on standard accusations against philosophers, claiming we discuss things in the clouds and below the earth, that we deny the gods and make bad arguments look good. They don't want to admit they've been outed for their ignorance. Now, because there are a lot of them, and they're ambitious, persuasive, and loud, they've filled your ears with baseless accusations against me. And that's why my three accusers, Miletus for the poets, Anitus for the craftsmen, Lycan for the rhetoricians, are attacking me. Changing such deep-seated opinions won't happen overnight. I've told you the whole truth without hiding or sugarcoating anything, but I know my honesty will just make them hate me more. And isn't their hatred just proof that I'm telling the truth? That's why they've been slandering me, which you'll realize during this or any future investigation. I've made my case against the first group of accusers. Now I'll defend myself against the second lot, led by Miletus, the so-called good and patriotic man. What does he accuse me of? Essentially, he claims I'm a wrongdoer, corrupting the youth, not believing in the state's gods and introducing new ones. Let's break down these accusations. He says, I'm evil, corrupting the youth. But here's what I say. Athenians, it's Miletus who's the real wrongdoer, turning serious matters into a joke, hasty to put others on trial for things he doesn't care about. And I'll prove this to be true. So, Miletus, let's have a little chat. You're really keen on improving our youth, right? Indeed I am. Well then, enlighten the judges. If you've gone to all the trouble to find out who's corrupting the youth, and even brought me here to accuse me, surely you must know who's doing a good job improving them. Speak up, Miletus. Why so silent? Isn't it shameful that you can't answer? It just proves my point. You really don't care, do you? Come on, tell us who's their improver. The laws. No, no, Miletus, you misunderstood me. I'm not asking about the laws. I want to know who's that person who understands these laws first and foremost. That would be the judges, Socrates, those who are present in court. So, Miletus, are you saying these judges have the power to instruct and improve the youth? Absolutely, they do. All of them, or just some? All of them. By the goddess. Here, that's great news. So many improvers. And what about the audience? Do they improve the youth as well? Yes, they do. What about the senator? Yes, the senators improve them too. So, do the members of the citizen assembly corrupt them, or do they improve them as well? Yeah, that they improve them. So every Athenian contributes to bettering and elevating our youth, except me. I'm the only one corrupting them. Is that your argument? Exactly. That's my claim. That's unfortunate for me if it's true. But let me ask you something. Consider horses. Is there one person who harms them while everyone else benefits them? Isn't it the opposite? There's typically one person, or very few like a trainer, who does them good, while others who interact with them may actually cause harm. That's true, right, Miletus? Regardless of whether you or Anitus agree, think about it. Our youth would be very lucky if they only had one corrupter and everyone else were their improvers. Your lack of concern about our youth, Miletus, is evident from your disregard for the matters we're discussing here. Now, another question for you, Miletus. What's better, to live among good citizens or bad ones? That's an easy question. The good ones benefit their neighbours while the bad ones harm them, right? Indeed, that's correct. So is there anyone who would rather be harmed than benefited by those around him? Answer honestly, Miletus. The law requires it. Does anyone enjoy being harmed? Certainly not. So, Miletus, when you accuse me of corrupting the youth, are you saying I'm doing this deliberately or by accident? Deliberately, I claim. But just now you agreed that good people do good things to their neighbours and bad people do bad things. Here's something you seem to have figured out early in life, Miletus, something I, at my age, apparently failed to grasp. If I corrupt someone I live with, isn't it likely I'll be harmed by them in return? But here you are, saying that I knowingly do this, that's a claim you'll never make me believe. Either I'm not corrupting the youth, or if I am, it's unintentional. So either way, you're wrong. If it's unintentional, the law doesn't punish that. You should have pulled me aside, warned me, if you had, and I understood, I'd have stopped whatever it was I was doing unintentionally. But you didn't want to teach me. You brought me to court, a place of punishment, not learning. I've demonstrated, fellow Athenians, that Miletus doesn't really care about this at all. But Miletus, I'd still like to understand how you think I'm corrupting the youth. Are you saying, as your accusation suggests, that I'm teaching them to reject the state-approved gods and embrace new divinities instead? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Miletus, for the love of the gods we're discussing, clarify it for me and the court. I don't get it. Are you saying I do believe in some gods, just not the ones approved by the city? 
or are you saying I'm a total atheist and a teacher of atheism? I'm saying you're a complete atheist. That's quite the statement, Miletus. What makes you say that? Are you suggesting I don't believe in the divinity of the sun or the moon, beliefs held by everyone? He doesn't believe in them judges. He claims the sun is stone and the moon is earth. Miletus, you're accusing me of believing in Anaxagoras's teachings, not mine. You underestimate the judges if you think they don't know those ideas are from Anaxagoras, and the youth can hear those ideas at the theatre for just a drachma. They could laugh at me if I claimed such absurdities. So, Miletus, do you really think I don't believe in any god? I swear by Zeus, you don't believe in any god. You're a liar, Miletus, and you don't even believe your own words. It seems to me, fellow Athenians, that Miletus is reckless and insolent, indicting me out of juvenile mischief. He's playing a riddle game, trying to trap me in a contradiction. He's saying I'm guilty of both believing and not believing in the gods. That's absurd. Join me, Athenians, in exposing Miletus' inconsistencies. And Miletus, answer clearly, without interrupting. Have you ever known someone, Miletus, who believes in human achievements but not human beings? Or in horsemanship but not in horses? Or in flute playing but not in flute players? Since you're not answering, I'll do it for you, no one. Now, can a person believe in spiritual and divine forces but not in spirits or demigods? Impossible. You claim, but in your indictment, that I teach and believe in divine or spiritual agencies. So, if I believe in such entities, then I must believe in spirits or demigods, right? And what are these, if not gods, or the offspring of gods? <laughs> exactly. So, here's your riddle unraveled. If demigods are gods, then claiming that I believe in them contradicts your accusation that I don't believe in gods. If demigods are the illegitimate offspring of gods, then their existence implies the existence of their parents. It's like affirming the existence of mules while denying horses and donkeys. This, Miletus, is nonsense. You've included it in your indictment because you had nothing real to accuse me of. But no rational person will ever believe your claim that someone could believe in divine and superhuman things without believing in gods, demigods, and heroes. So here's my defense against Miletus's claims. I don't need to make a big scene about it, but as I've said before, I've got a lot of haters. If I go down, it won't be because of Miletus or Anitus, but because of the jealousy and negative chatter from society. We've seen it before. It's taken down a lot of great folks, and it'll probably continue to do so. If I'm the next casualty, I wouldn't be surprised. Now some might ask, Socrates, aren't you ashamed? Your lifestyle is going to cut your life short. To that I'd say they're missing the point. A person who's worth their salt shouldn't worry about the odds of dying or living. What matters is whether we're doing right or wrong, being good people or bad. By your logic, the heroes who fought and died in Troy, especially Achilles, must not have been worth much. Achilles didn't care about danger or death when he set out to kill Hector to avenge Patroclus. His mother, a goddess, even warned him, Kill Hector and you're next. But did that stop him? No, he didn't care about death or danger. He cared about honor and revenge. He said, let me die next so I can avenge my friend. I'd rather die than live in shame. See, he knew that we should stand our ground in the face of danger and not let the fear of death or anything else intimidate us. When I served in Potidaea, Amphipolis, and Delium, under generals you chose, I faced danger head on. It would be strange now when I believe my divine duty is to challenge myself and others philosophically if I abandoned my post out of fear of death. It would be almost as if I was denying the existence of gods. The fear of death is often mistaken for wisdom, but it's just a pretense. Nobody knows what death truly holds. It might be the greatest good, not the terrible evil we fear. Isn't claiming knowledge of the unknown a kind of ignorance? I think that's where I might be wiser than others. I know I don't know much about what comes after death, but I know that doing wrong and disobeying superior moral authorities, whether they be gods or men, is bad. I won't choose an uncertain good over a certain evil. And so, my fellow citizens of Athens, here I stand before you facing the consequences of my beliefs and teachings. Anitus, one of my accusers, has warned that if I were to escape capital punishment, your sons would be led astray, their lives ruined by the influence of my words. But I ask you, is it truly my words that, that pose a threat to the youth of this great city? If you were to release me on the condition that I cease my inquiries and philosophical speculations, and should I ever be caught engaging in such practices again, I would face death. I must respond with unwavering conviction. My dear Athenians, I hold deep respect and love for you, but my allegiance lies with a higher power, with God. As long as I have breath in my body, I shall continue to practice and teach philosophy, unyielding in my pursuit of wisdom and truth. I will not cease to approach every person I meet with my characteristic style of questioning and examination. I implore them, saying, Oh, my friend, why do you place such great importance on amassing wealth, 
honor and reputation, while neglecting the pursuit of wisdom and the improvement of your soul, are you not ashamed of this imbalance? If they claim to care about virtue, I do not simply let them go. Instead, I delve deeper, interrogating and cross-examining them. If I find their professed virtue to be lacking, I admonish them for undervaluing the greater and overvaluing the lesser. This is the conversation I engage in with every person, whether young or old, citizen or foreigner. However, my message is especially directed at my fellow citizens, for we are bound by a shared destiny. I firmly believe that there is no greater good I can bring to our state than by fulfilling the command of God, day in and day out, I am tirelessly persuading all of you to prioritize the greatest improvement of the soul, to not be consumed by worldly possessions and personal gains. Let it be known that virtue cannot be attained through wealth alone. It is from virtue that prosperity, both for individuals and society, flows naturally. This is the core of my teachings. If indeed these teachings corrupt the youth, then my influence is truly destructive. But if anyone claims that this is not what I teach, they speak falsehood. Therefore, I implore you, O people of Athens, to decide my fate according to the will of Anitus, or disregard his counsel entirely. Acquit me or convict me, but know this, I shall never waver in my convictions, even if I must face death countless times. My commitment to the pursuit of wisdom, truth, and the betterment of the soul remains steadfast till the end. Listen to me, people of Athens, don't interrupt. I think what I have to say next might benefit you, even though you may want to object, but please, bear with me. Understand this. If you kill me, you'd be doing more harm to yourselves than to me. Neither Miletus nor Anitus can harm me. It's against the laws of nature for a bad person to harm someone better than them. They might kill me, exile me, or take away my rights, and they might think they're hurting me severely. But I disagree, because the real harm lies in what Anitus is doing, unjustly taking a life which is a far worse evil. I'm not making this argument for my sake, but for yours to prevent you from sinning against the gods or carelessly ignoring their gift by condemning me. If you kill me, you won't find someone like me easily. I am, if you pardon the silly analogy, like a gadfly given to the state by the gods. The state is like a large, slow-moving horse that needs a bit of agitation to get moving. I'm that gadfly, constantly prodding you, challenging you, urging you to wake up. You might find it annoying to be awakened from your comfortable slumber. You might think that killing me, as Anita suggests, would let you sleep peacefully for the rest of your lives unless the gods decide to send you another gadfly. The fact that I was sent by the gods is evident in my actions. If I were like other men, I would have prioritized my own affairs and not yours, reminding you, like a father or an older brother, to focus on virtue. If I had gained anything from this, or if I charged for my advice, then it would make sense. But no one, not even my accusers, could say that I ever asked for or demanded money. My poverty is proof enough of my honesty. You might wonder why I go around in private giving advice, but don't dare to do the same in public for the state. It's because of an oracle or sign that I've been getting since childhood. This sign, which Miletus mocks, is a voice that stops me from doing things, but never directs me to do anything. This sign has prevented me from becoming a politician. I believe this was for the best because I am certain that if I had been involved in politics, I would have died long ago and been of no use to you or myself. Hear this truth, unpalatable as it may be. No man who opposes the unrighteousness in the state can survive if he's in a public position. If he wishes to live even for a little while, he must hold a private station. Let me share an incident from my own life that proves I never backed down from injustice, even under the threat of death. The only public office I held was that of senator during the trial of generals after the Battle of Arginusi. The trial was illegal, and I was the only one who voted against it despite threats of impeachment and arrest. I decided to stand my ground for justice, not yielding to fear of death or imprisonment. During the rule of the Thirty Tyrants, they ordered me and four others to bring Leon the Salaminian from Salamis for execution. This was their way of implicating as many people as possible in their crimes, but I did not give in to fear of death and refused to partake in this unjust act. I wouldn't have survived all these years if I led a public life, always standing up for what's right and prioritizing justice. I or anyone else couldn't have, but in my private life I've been the same, not yielding to those who falsely called themselves my disciples or to anyone else. In fact, I don't have regular disciples. If anyone wants to hear me, young or old, they are free to do so. I don't only speak to those who can pay, rich or poor, anyone can listen to me. If they turn out good or bad, that can't be attributed to me, as I've never taught them anything. If someone claims to have learned or heard anything from me privately, something the rest of the world hasn't heard, know that they are lying. 
You may wonder why so many people are eager to chat with me all the time. Honestly, the answer is simple. They enjoy witnessing my questioning of those who claim to be wise. It's entertaining, and I believe it's a duty bestowed upon me by a higher power. I've received messages through visions and signs like anyone who has ever felt divine guidance. Believe it or not, it can be put to the test. If I have indeed been leading the youth astray, as some claim, then those I have misguided, who are now grown up and realize my counsel was harmful, should stand up against me. And if they're too shy, their family members, fathers, brothers, or other kin should voice the harm I've done. The time is ripe. I see many of them right here. Look around. There's Crito, a fellow townsman of my age, and his son, Critobulus, right here. Lysanias from Sveta's father of Eschines is also present, and so is Antiphon from Cephasus, Epignes' father. I see brothers of people who've hung out with me. There's Nicostratus, the son of Theostotides, and brother of Theodotus, who has passed away. Paralus, the son of Demodocus, and Adimantus, Plato's brother, are here, and Eantodorus, Apollodorus' brother, is here as well. All of these people could have been called upon by my accuser, Melitus, during his speech, and even now he can call upon them. What's shocking is that they, the relatives of those I've supposedly corrupted, aren't here to condemn me. Rather, they're here to defend me. Why? Because they value truth and justice, and they know I speak the truth while Miletus lies. Fellow Athenians, that's about all the defense I have, but I've got something else to say. Perhaps someone among you is annoyed because, in a similar situation, they begged and cried, used their kids for emotional leverage and rallied friends and family, while I've refrained from such actions. Maybe this offends them, triggering a vote against me in irritation. But let me clarify, I'm human, made of flesh and blood, not wood or stone. I have a family, three sons. Yet I won't parade them here to plea for my innocence, not because I'm aloof or disregard your opinions, but because I believe it's beneath me and beneath you as a state. It's inappropriate for someone of my age, my reputation, to stoop so low. Our society deems me in some way superior, whether rightly or wrongly, when those reputed for wisdom and virtue act in a low manner. It tarnishes their reputation and dishonors the state. I've witnessed respected men, when condemned, behave in odd ways, pleading for immortality as if death were the worst fate. It's shameful and makes us look weak. Aside from the question of dignity, I see something inherently wrong in begging a judge for acquittal rather than convincing him with arguments. A judge's role is to deliver justice, not favors. He has sworn to uphold the law, not personal whims. We should never encourage perjury. There's no honor in that. So don't ask me to do what I consider dishonorable, impious, and wrong, especially now when I'm on trial for impiety because of Miletus. If I were to persuade you against your oaths, I'd be teaching you there are no gods and contradicting my own beliefs. However, I do believe in gods even more than any of my accusers do. I leave my fate in your hands to decide what's best for you and me. Now, despite his eloquent defense and rational discourse, the jury ultimately concludes their deliberation with a verdict against Socrates, finding him guilty as charged. Following the Athenian legal custom of the time, once found guilty, Socrates was given an opportunity to propose his own sentence as an alternative to the one suggested by his accusers. Now we turn to the words that Socrates himself puts forward, presenting his proposal for what he believes to be a fitting sentence for his so-called crimes. My friends of Athens, I cannot pretend to be shocked by the condemnation. I expected it, surprised only by how closely the votes tallied. I thought the majority against me would be more considerable. Yet, had 30 more votes swayed in my favour, I'd be free. And in this I claim victory over Miletus, who would have been powerless without Anitus and Lycan's aid, and now he suggests death as my fate. So, what do I propose, you may ask? Clearly what I deserve. And what should befall a man who never indulged in idleness? A man who overlooked worldly pursuits like wealth, politics or social prestige for a life dedicated to larger ideals? Contemplating my honesty, I couldn't follow the norm and still be of service to you or myself. I've strived to encourage you to seek virtue and wisdom before personal gains, putting the welfare of our state before individual benefits. And what should happen to such a man? Surely something good if he receives his due reward. A fitting reward for a poor benefactor like me, desiring leisure to teach you, would be upkeep at the Prytaneum. This I deserve more than any victor in an Olympic race, for they provide the illusion of happiness, while I offer you the reality. You may perceive my statements as brazen. But I assure you, I say this, because I believe I've never intentionally harmed anyone. But in our short conversation, I haven't been able to convince you. Had we more time, as is allowed in other cities, I may have persuaded you. Why would I propose a penalty to myself, especially death, when its nature, good or evil, remains unknown to me? Shall I suggest imprisonment, becoming a slave to the system, or a fine when I can't pay? 
or perhaps exile when my teachings have already been rejected by my own kin, why would others welcome me? As I wander from city to city, facing constant rejection, I'd be followed by young men hungry for wisdom. If I shun them, their elders would banish me, and if I let them come, their families would expel me for their sake. You may suggest I keep my teachings to myself, but obeying such would be a disobedience to a divine command. Even if I explain that the greatest good is to daily converse about virtue, and that an unexamined life isn't worth living, you may not believe me. Yet it is the truth. I don't believe I deserve any punishment. Had I money, I might propose a fine equal to my means, but I have none. My friends here, Plato, Crito, Critobulus, and Apollodorus, suggest a fine of thirty minae and volunteer as sureties. So I propose this penalty, which they assure you. So the Athenian jury, bound by the confines of their judgment and public sentiment, declare the irrevocable sentence, the death penalty for Socrates. However, Socrates true to his unwavering spirit, offers his profound reflections on this austere verdict. Athenians, you won't buy yourselves much time by silencing me, a philosopher, though it may damage your reputation. Those who scorn you will now say you've killed a wise man. You see, I'm old and death was always around the corner. I'm addressing now those who voted for my execution. You might believe I've been convicted due to my inability to articulate my thoughts, that if I'd begged and pleaded as others do, I could have swayed your opinion. However, I'd argue that it wasn't a deficiency in words that led to this verdict. It was my unwillingness to resort to emotional manipulation to buy your sympathy. I didn't want to indulge in theatrics or grovel for mercy. I believe it's beneath me to do something petty or common, even in the face of death. I'd rather die with dignity, expressing myself authentically, than to live by pandering to your expectations. Sure, in war or even in a situation like this, there are always ways to avoid death if you're willing to stoop low enough. But the real challenge isn't evading death, it's evading wrongdoing. Wrongdoing is always the fastest runner. I, as an old man, have been caught by death, while my accusers, sharp and quick, have been caught by their villainy. Now, I'll face the death you've prescribed, and my accusers will face the consequences of their deeds. This seems fated and fair. I want to make a prediction, as it's said that the dying have prophetic powers. After my death, you, my executioners, will face a harsher punishment than the one you've imposed on me. You think by silencing me, you're avoiding critique of your actions, but I assure you, more critics will arise, and they'll be younger and even harsher. Remember, eliminating your critics isn't the way to improvement or redemption. The best way forward is self-improvement. Now, to those who would have acquitted me, I have some words before my departure. Death may not be the dreadful end we fear, but may be a doorway to something good. Think about it. Either death is like an undisturbed sleep, or it's a transition to another existence. If it's the former, then it's a peaceful rest, better than many nights we've experienced. If it's the latter, a journey to another world where all the greats reside, wouldn't that be fantastic? Imagine conversing with the heroes of law, the pioneers of thought, or the unjustly punished like myself. The chance to explore their wisdom would be worth dying again and again. And what greater joy would there be than to continue the pursuit of truth, to decipher who's truly wise and who only pretends to be? So don't fear death, for no harm can come to a good person, neither in life nor after. I believe my death is not a random occurrence, but for the better, hence the gods didn't prevent it. Don't be mistaken, I hold no grudge against my accusers or judges. My only request, dear friends, when my sons grow up, if they seem more concerned about wealth than virtue, if they pretend to be someone they're not, then please correct them as I have done for you. If you do this, justice will have been served. My friends, the moment of parting has arrived. We each embark on our separate path, I towards death and you towards life. The question of which is better remains a mystery known only to the divine. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our journey through the words of Socrates, one of history's most revered thinkers. We hope this modernized rendition of his powerful speech has left you inspired and ignited a thirst for knowledge within you. Socrates' unwavering commitment to truth, his relentless pursuit of wisdom, and his unyielding integrity serve as a timeless reminder for us all. In a world filled with distractions and noise, his message resonates, urging us to question, reflect, and seek deeper understanding. As we part ways, let us carry the spirit of Socrates with us, embracing the importance of critical thinking, self-examination, and the pursuit of virtue. Let us challenge our own beliefs, engage in meaningful dialogue, and strive for a life of moral growth and personal integrity. Thank you for joining us on this enlightening journey through the mind of Socrates. Until we meet again on our next exploration of intellectual treasures from the past, may you find purpose and fulfillment on your own journey.